Good morning. Welcome to worship, and what a blessing to have you with us today. Whether you are a first-time visitor or you are a long-time member, it is a joy to have you, and you are welcome here to worship with us. We continue the, the Easter theme that we have been celebrating, looking at the victory of Jesus, risen from the dead and living, showing us that that victory is one that brings us into a unity and a oneness with God and with each other. We'll follow that theme in our service today in our worship folder. We'll begin with the opening hymn. God bless our time with him today. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. 
I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Also with you. 
Let us pray. O oh God, you are the giver of everything good. Inspire us, your humble servants, to long for what is right and through your gracious guidance, accomplish it to your glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today's first reading is from the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 16. The Lord called on the Apostle Paul to bring others into the, un the unity of the church. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join in the psalm. The second reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 22, we see the victory and the unity that is ours in heaven. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and they go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, 
those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel from John chapter 17. These words, this prayer of Jesus will serve as a basis for today's sermon. My prayer is not for believers alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I may, myself may be in them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated.
I'm guessing that you have probably heard it said before that you ought to pray for others. In fact, maybe you have made such a sentiment to someone when you heard about their troubles. I'll pray for you or I am praying for you. Now, I really hope that you follow through on those words and not just flippantly throw that out as as though it's just something to say, but maybe even in that moment you pray for or even with that person. Now, the reason I bring that up is because of this. Do you know this? Jesus prayed for you. No joke. He personally had you in mind and on his heart as he prayed the prayer that we heard this morning from the gospel reading. Jesus prayed for all who would believe in his name, for future believers from that moment, like you and me. And this was a prayer that he prayed on the night that he was going to be betrayed by one of his very own disciples, Judas, and arrested by his enemies and the very next day be crucified and put to death. Now, what in the world could have been so important and urgent that Jesus had to pray for you on the very night before he's going to die the next day? We hear it in the prayer today. Jesus prayed for you that we might be one. It almost seems like Jesus could be true God, doesn't it? I mean, the fact that he would know all the different issues that we could go through in this life and that he would see and that he knows the most important thing to pray about is for us to be one, to have unity. But therein lies the beautiful truth, right? Jesus is true God. And as true God, he knows our greatest and deepest needs. And in the prayer that we reflect on this morning, we hear that one of the most important things that Jesus wanted for you and for me is to have unity. It almost seems like Jesus knew the world we would live in today, doesn't it? I mean, look around us and we live in a very divided and divisive world. In fact, let's just make a short list of things that divide us. Start us off with an easy one. Politics. That really gets people going, doesn't it? Or moral issues like abortion or human sexuality. Race. Culture divides us. Think about the things that that divide you, whether it's your neighbor or a person that you work with. They do things differently and it drives you nuts and you can't get along with them. Or think about the things that divide you just within your own family who you should or should not date or marry, whether you have to eat all the peas on your plate or not, um, how your grades really look in school and what school you're going to go to and what your career is going to be like and how you're not raising your kids the right way and who's going to take care of mom and dad in their old age, things that just set people off and cause divisions. And you could add a hundred other things to that list of things that you find yourself divided with in people in your life and in the world around you too. And it's in those moments that your sinful nature likes to make an appearance. And it likes to show just how self-centered and selfish we can be. It shows itself in arguments, in fighting, in shouting, in shutting down and shutting out others in the way that we mistreat and disregard other people. We often don't find ourselves as one, but divided. You pick sides and you pit yourself against one another. And that division causes so much hurt and harm and frustration and and resentment. And that division causes great problems. But it's much bigger than just a social problem. It's a problem with your heart, with your soul. Jesus came to be our Savior, not just to rescue us from our sins, but to pray that we might be one. Now, Jesus did not pray that we would be united with this sinful world. In fact, the Lord God says that we should separate ourselves from the wickedness of this world. But instead, Jesus prays that we would be united with God and with other believers so that through us, the world might know the Lord. 
Jesus said, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, the message of the apostles, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. To truly understand the oneness and unity that the Lord Jesus desires and prays about here in this prayer, you need to first of all understand the oneness that you enjoy with God. Now understand this first though. There is no greater dividing factor in this world than your own sin. It destroys relationships with people in your life and it decimates any kind of unity that you might have with God. Your sinful nature is hostile to God. It doesn't politely deny God and and disagree with Him, but it blatantly lashes out, No! I am not going to live your way, God. And it comes out in the words and the actions the way we act. Lord, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to do it my way. I don't need or want you. You know, God created people. He created you to have a relationship with him. But your sin separates you from God. It drives this massive wedge between you and God in your relationship, your oneness with him. Jesus prayed that this would not be. He did much more than just pray for this. Jesus had a very unique oneness with God the Father. He had this complete oneness and harmony and and, and togetherness with God because he is true God. It's the mystery of our God and the triune God. And as true God, Jesus so desperately wanted to bring you one, to be one with him and the Father, that he set aside all of that so that he could rescue you from your sins by completing the plan and all the requirements that God demanded for sinful people like you and me. And God, in his great love, accepted Jesus' sacrifice, this payment for sins, as your payment. And God now covers you and washes you clean of all of your sins through the blood of Jesus. And he makes you his very own dear child. And now you get to be one with God through faith in Jesus, who sets you free and brings you near to the Lord. Now, it's that same faith in God that also allows us to be one with one another. Jesus prayed that all believers would be one. And as he talks about this, and he wants us to bring us together to be one, we have to realize something. We are all different people. We have a lot of similarities, but as I am looking out at you this morning, you are all a bunch of different people with different personalities and priorities and expectations and experiences that you've had in life, and you come from different backgrounds and even cultures and races. And yet there is something that brings us together. And it's the very reason you're here this morning. It's Jesus. And you see, Jesus shows us that no matter what our background might be, we are all a bunch of crummy sinners that deserve God's wrath. But Jesus showed us that he died on the cross for every single person, regardless of color of skin or language or background. And he unites us together around this gospel message that he shares with us in word and sacrament, and he brings us together into one. We call it a church or the body of Christ. And this gathering of of believers is something that expands beyond time and space and language and nation. But it draws all people underneath the faith and trust in Jesus. We're reminded of of how diverse this unity can be when we hear of things and and keep in mind things like the the people in Ukraine that we are praying for, especially our, our brothers and sisters in faith in the Lutheran Church there who are in harm's way. Or when we hear stories that come from our world missions office in our synod about the wonderful ways that the gospel ministry is expanding and growing in Africa and in Latin America and how we are gaining these footholds to share Jesus with different Asian groups. 
is a reminder and a beautiful picture of how we are together with Christ, even though we might be separated by thousands of miles and even cultures, and yet in Christ, we are one. And this goes beyond just a diverse unity, but a oneness of mind and attitude that we share too. And it's a oneness that we cannot have unless we are in and with Jesus. The Apostle Paul explained this when he wrote in Galatians chapter 2. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, being with God means, and one with God means more than just having our sins washed away, but it means having a new life and a new heart and a new attitude like that of God. But that's only possible with Christ in us. And the more that we grow in that unity with God and we grow in his word, the more we will see that Christ-like attitude prevail in our lives as you start to set aside your own needs and put the needs of others before you. Because that's where oneness starts. So what if? What if we set aside all of our differences in order to love and encourage one another as believers? What if you really got to know your church family here? And you weren't quick to judge and you didn't rush out the doors on Sunday morning, but you really took a moment to not just introduce yourself to someone you're sitting next to, but really got to know them. What if we studied the Bible together and heard each other's stories and learned how we can best support and encourage and pray for one another and realize that we are really more one than we even realize? What would that look like to our community or to the world? I think I know what it would look like. And maybe I can put it into perspective with a, a simple little story, a little picture. Even you kids will understand this. A whole class of five-year-olds go out for recess and are playing on the playground. And one little boy comes up to the teacher with tears in his eyes and says, teacher, those boys are being mean to me. Well, what's the problem? They said my shoes are ugly and I can't play with them. Well, that's not true. Are, are there other kids that you'd like to play with? And at that moment, a little girl from another group of kids who are playing on the playground comes over, invites him to come and play with them, and his face lights up, and with a smile, he looks at his teacher and says, I'm going to go play with them because they're nice to each other, and they're going to let me play with them. What if the church of God, us as the church of God, and, and not just the church on the corner of Juno and Broadway, but the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, showed such a oneness in knowing Jesus Christ that others wanted to come and to live life with us, to live eternal life with us. Make us one, Lord. And that's the point. The gospel is here to unite us to God and to one another and to show the world Jesus. Let's show the world Jesus. Jesus said, Then the world will know that you sent me, God, and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus prayed that we would have unity with him and with one another so that we could be with him forever and see and know his glory. So often we get wrapped up in chasing after the glory of this world, our own personal kind of glory. And that, that pursuit of glory is the kind of thing that brings up so much division in our world. It's that sinful pursuit of glory that is the thing of wars and of unhealthy competition and of tearing each other down. But Jesus wants to set before you a glory that is so vastly different, a glory that is unique, a glory that is found only in him. And he tells you to look and find victory in a sacrifice, to see victory in death, and to see life and victory in an empty tomb. Because there, my friends, in Jesus, because he died and rose again, that is where we see glory. 
Glory that God's plan of salvation was fulfilled. Glory that Jesus has reunited us with God for the forgiveness of sins. Glory that God brings us to be together as one. This coming Thursday is the ascension of Jesus. And we're going to be celebrating here at Grace with a special meal and a little devotional service and a presentation from our world missions to see how the gospel is being shared. You are all invited. I'd love for you all to join us. There's more info in the Grace Notes. Take a peek and sign up. But the ascension of Jesus is this beautiful reminder, an opportunity for us to reflect on the truth that our living Savior has ascended to heaven, is seated at the right hand of God the Father, where he is ruling and reigning over all things, his church. And as that high priest, he continues to intercede for you still today. In other words, Jesus is still praying for you. And his prayer today is the same as it was on the night he was betrayed. He prays that you would continue to remain one with God and one with the people he sets before you. And so, my friends, my prayer for you today is the same thing. Lord, may we be one. Amen. Please stand. And having heard the word of our Lord Jesus, we join together in our one faith using the words of the Nicene Creed which are printed on page 8. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for prayer. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who has risen from the dead and ascended to the right hand of God, we thank and praise you for opening the kingdom of heaven to us sinners and for calling us into that kingdom through faith worked by the gospel message. What joy it is to be united as one with believers in your kingdom. Keep us in the true faith until the end, giving us a hunger for your word and nourishing us through it. Let your kingdom come to many others by multiplying the preaching of your gospel in the world. Bless and keep our missionaries who boldly and faithfully share the gospel. Aid us against every temptation and strengthen us in every trial until we receive the victor's crown of everlasting life. Give your healing to all who suffer in body, mind, or soul. Comfort those who mourn. Especially be with the family of Merton Hess, father of Sue Grams, who you took to be with you this past week. Thank you for his faith and his faithful witness to those you bless to be near to him. Give the family the peace that comes from the life that is ours because you rose from the dead and live on high. We pray this in all things in your holy name. Amen.
We continue with the sacrament of Holy Communion, page 9. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, who by his willing sacrifice on the cross took away the sins of the world and by his re glorious resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed are you, O God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his victory over the grave, our Savior declared death's reign ended, the door to heaven open, and the payment for sin complete. We celebrate with joy the glorious resurrection of your Son. We marvel at the depth of your love. We stand in awe of your power. We are humbled by the compassion you have shown our fallen race. Lead us to rejoice in the pardon offered and sealed in this sacrament, and to live a life worthy of your name. The Lord Jesus lives. Alleluia. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand as we join together with the words of thanksgiving on page 11. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, O oh God, the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you again for joining us, worshiping our risen and living Savior today. A special welcome to our guests. We're very happy to have you with us. A quick encouragement to guests and members alike, take a moment to sign our friendship registers, the black folders in, in the pew, or use the connect cards. Helps us stay connected to you with God's grace. Also encourage you to take a look at the grace notes. There you're going to find more information about the Ascension event this coming Thursday that you'll want to be at. Also Bible study that is taking place next door with Pastor Hockman. You'll also want to be there this morning to continue to grow as one. And you'll also see other things like job opportunities here at Grace and ways to be together with God's people. Take a moment to get to know one another. God bless your week.